is Raphael Landowitz. I'm professor of medicine in the Division of Infectious Disease at University of California, Los Angeles. I'm also the co-director of the UCLA Center for Clinical AIDS Research and Education. And the title of my talk is HPTN 083, Where Did We Go Right? Thank you. I would like to thank the organizers of the meeting for the opportunity to share these thoughts on the HPTN 083 study design and statistical considerations. I've, as you know, I've titled this talk HPTN 083, Where Did We Go? Well, actually that's wrong. Quite the, the title of the talk is Where Did We Go Right? Um, uh, these are my disclosures. Um, I'm going to begin with the briefest of reviews. Um, I think everyone uh, uh, at this meeting probably is aware of the uh, randomized uh, placebo-controlled efficacy data for TDF-FTC-based oral PrEP, um, uh, which I've demonstrated in these iconic figures, um, demonstrating the point, uh, the, the point efficacy estimate um, for each of the large randomized efficacy studies for oral TDF FTC prep that have constituted our understanding of the profound efficacy of both daily oral TDF FTC in, across populations and contexts um, and uh, the on demand or 211 dosing for MSM populations for the same product. The scope of uh, oral PrEP has expanded um, to include some additional agents, including TAF-FTC for MSM and trans women, um, the depivirine ring uh, for cisgender women, and now, of course, uh, long-acting injectable cabotegravir, um, having demonstrated um, efficacy levels that are substantial um, among uh, men who have sex with men and transgender women in the HPTN 083 study that we presented at AIDS 2020 earlier this summer. I will briefly remind you of the HPTN 083 study design um, and contextualize that the, the, the study was intended to provide a pre-exposure prophylaxis option for individuals who might be challenged by realizing um, the, uh, the tremendous efficacy potential um, of tenofovir-based pre-exposure prophylaxis. So by intent and by design, the study population of HPTN 083 was a population enriched for those disproportionately affected by HIV and uh, based on randomized and observational data challenged um, by the uptake um, adherence and persistence necessary to achieve population level reductions in HIV incidence through um, uh, oral pre-exposure prophylaxis. The safety um, of long-acting injectable cabotegravir had been previously demonstrated um, in a pair of phase two randomized placebo controlled trials, the VIVE sponsored ACLAIR study and the NIH Division of AIDS sponsored HPTN 077 study. And this was the follow-up study to those studies in men who have sex with men and transgender women. It was a phase 2B3 randomized double blind double dummy study that was done at 43 sites globally, enrolled individuals at least age, age 18 um, who were at elevated risk for HIV acquisition um, using the definitions that you can see in the second bullet on this slide, generally in good health without hepatitis B or C without contraindications to gluteal injections or other um, uh, medical conditions that might put them at risk from uh, the novel injectable product. The original sample size uh, that we were planning to enroll was 5,000 and we had pre-specified that certain disproportionately affected groups historically under-enrolled under um, in, in HIV prevention trials would be adequately represented for generalization in this study, that being at least 50% of the population would be young under the age of 30, at least 10% would be transgender women, and at least 50% of the enrollment within the United States would be self-identifying as Black or African American. The primary safety and primary efficacy endpoints um, are indicated here. Everyone is familiar with the study design. It was a three-step study. Individuals were randomized one-to-one -one 
um, upon uh, enrollment uh, and eligibility confirmation to either cabotegravir arm or a TDF FTC arm, where they started with a five week oral lead in where individuals received one active and one placebo tablet for five weeks after adequate safety and tolerability was assessed and evaluated, they progressed to step two where they either uh, received active cabotegravir injections on an every eight week schedule um, for approximately a total of three years and they continued their placebo for TDF FTC or they received placebo for the injectable product and continued active oral TDF FTC. If anyone stopped injectable product prematurely in this stage, they were um, shunted over to a step three phase where they received open label TDF FTC um, for an additional 12 months as cabotegravir product were allowed to um, wash out of the system. They were then transitioned to locally available prevention services. The original statistical study design uh, that, that was in our statistical analysis plan for efficacy had the following important elements. It was a non-inferiority design. The pre-specified non-inferiority margin was 1.23, so a relative non-inferiority margin of 23%. There was an alternative hypothesis of a hazard ratio of 0.75, that being that we anticipated that cabotegravir, because of the structural difference in uh, antiviral coverage it would provide compared to daily oral TDF FTC, um, would be at least 25% better than the TDF FTC. We anticipated that we would enroll a population with a background HIV incidence of about four and a half um, per hundred person years. And we anticipated that based on the population we were trying to enroll, the TDF FTC adherence as measured by plasma tenofovir would be detectable in approximately 57% um, of the TDF FTC participants. We'll come back to those assumptions when I tell you what we actually found. Um, this was an endpoint driven trial with 172 events um, uh, uh, being determined to be appropriately power the study. There were pre-specified interim analyses at three time points when 25%, 50%, and 75% of enrollments had been accrued, and O'Brien Fleming stopping boundaries for interim data analysis were used to determine the metrics for early stopping. Um, at the first uh, of those pre-specified interim analyses, when 25% of the anticipated endpoints had been accrued, the DSMB, which had been meeting periodically approximately every six months since the beginning of the study, additionally evaluated the efficacy um, of the, the comparison. And at that point on May 14th of this year, recommended termination of the blinded study um, after their interim analysis as pre-specified crossed the pre-specified stopping bound. Um, the results that I'm gonna be presenting and discussing include events that occurred through May 14th, 2020, when participants were subsequently unblinded, they continue on study and all, and all participants per the DSMB recommendation are being offered open label cabotegravir um, uh, as soon as it's available at the sites. So how did we come to that non-inferiority margin of 1.23? Well, we used um, standard non-inferiority calculations. We performed a meta regression of the available um, TDF FTC versus placebo randomized um, data that weighted uh, the data based on the number of incident events that happened uh, in each of the trials. Um, and so we preserved half of that treatment effect using standard calculations and came up with a 1.23 margin, which was vetted and discussed with um, the United States Regulatory Agency, the FDA. Um, uh, we could have, of course, and considered using all of um, the available TDF FTC um, randomized data available across populations and contexts, but we decided that that was not appropriate. We also could have um, picked uh, select populations within the MSM studies. Um, for example, those who only had reported um, condomless receptive intercourse uh, prior to study enrollment um, to enrich um, the population for that group, but we opted to not do that and be most rigorous 
in the choice of the non-inferiority margin. We did perform an additional meta regression as shown here using all of the available um, randomized data um, that would um, let us uh, 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 do some important calculations later on in the study, but this was not used for the non-inferiority margin calculation. Um, in terms of our sample size estimation, there were some uh, challenges to its determination, not only the non-inferiority margin that I briefly touched upon, um, it also uh, uh, it was dependent upon the assumed hazard ratio. As I mentioned, we assumed a hazard ratio of 0 0.75 for CAB LA um, versus TDF FTC. The zero incidence rate, which I mentioned, we estimated at 4.5 per 100 person years and the desired length of follow-up. These are the parameters that we chose to populate our model to, in order to do the sample size calculation. We decided that a reasonable length of follow-up on average for participants in the study would be two and a half years. Um, when one considers the sample size implications um, using uh, the non-inferiority margin of 1.23 and one fixes the uh, anticipated efficacy of cab LA versus TDF-FTC at 25%, you can see that you're required um, uh, to have 172 events with approximately 4,257 person years of follow-up. Um, and therefore, when one calculates um, the, uh, the number of individuals who would need to contribute um, that with an average of two and a half years of follow-up, um, uh, we, uh, we came up with that sample size um, of somewhere between 4,500 um, and, uh, and 5,000 uh, different individuals. Um, so when we began the study in December of 2016, those assumptions were in place. And of course, the assumptions that are made before a study start do not always continue to be valid through the, throughout the, the study conduct. We had some immediate uh, challenges to our initial assumptions because the non-US sites had unanticipated delays in activation and study initiation, which resulted in disproportionate enrollment in the United States up front, which of course um, skewed uh, the risk of the population towards a more US risk profile, which would have been anticipated to have lower HIV incidence than some other areas um, in the world where the study was going to be conducted but had not yet begun study activities. In fact, confirmatory of those fears of that skewing of the early enrollment, the May 2019 SMC and DSMB did observe lower than anticipated pooled incidents and in fact represent, rec rec recommended to the study team that we increased our sample size from the original 4,500 to 5,000 um, from, uh, from high incidence settings and participants in order to account for that lower than anticipated initial pooled incidence, um, which was largely driven by US enrollment. Um, there was a lot of concern uh, by some on our team uh, about an inability to demonstrate a regulatorily actionable result um, due to the low pooled incidence that prompted some discussion about whether a mid-study change in the pre-specified non-inferiority margin would be appropriate, pointing out in specific, and I alluded to this earlier, that the DISCOVER study of TAF-FTC versus TDF-FTC um, uh, um, uh, acquired uh, FDA agreement that an, a non-inferiority margin of 1.62 was appropriate, and that non-inferiority margin was derived largely using the three same uh, randomized TDF-FTC um, uh, uh, studies uh, in MSM and trans women that we had used, but used um, a, a subset of those, uh, those study populations who reported um, condomless receptive anal intercourse in the period prior to study entry, and also weighted all three of the studies evenly, even though the number of incident events was uh, distinct between those three studies, and that gave additional weight to the Ipergay and the Proud study in that meta regression calculation. Um, of course, uh, uh, as those discussions were ongoing, the COVID epidemic uh, came upon us and threatened to disrupt study conduct 
um, uh, in the middle of the study with a compromised ability of some of our sites to deliver, deliver injectable study products either through shutdowns um, at the sites themselves and therefore an inability to provide products or an unwillingness of participants or an inability of participants based on local reg 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 regulations to, um, to uh, arrive at study sites. And um, there was a need for oral prep bridging during some portions of the study um, in order to maintain participant safety um, while they were unable to um, receive injections. In anticipation of that, um, what ended up being the final DSMB in May of 2020, um, we did have to acknowledge that that data cut, whose data was cut roughly at the end of March, was the last data cut that was likely to be unaffected by the COVID-19 disruption, which really began to affect sites at the beginning of April of 2020. Additionally, we were extremely concerned as we watched the evolution of the trial um, uh, about premature discontinuation of blinded study products by our participants. Um, in particular, we acknowledged that we were enrolling a very young, very at risk, and therefore a very chaotic population with high mobility and high loss to follow up. So with that risk seemed to come a challenge to maintain them on blinded study product. And you can see um, that by approximately three years on study, we were over 30% of our participants off blinded study product, which had the potential to dilute the ITT analysis to the null. And so we were also extremely concerned about the ability to, um, to be able to demonstrate an effect um, because of this, um, this, this loss to follow up. Um, and I would be clear to say that not all of those participants were lost to follow up because uh, we did follow people off blinded study product through a variety of additional trajectories in order to continue to evaluate their, um, their status with regard to HIV um, acquisition um, over the ITT analysis period. I think everyone at this conference is also aware of the primary results. Um, we found 52 incident HIV infections in 6,389 person years. When we looked at data through that date of the May 14th DSMB as a cutoff, um, uh, the participants were followed a median of 1.4 person years um, uh, per participant with a pooled incidence of 0 0.81 per hundred person years. And those were unequally, unequally distributed in the arms with the cabotegravir arm having an incidence of 0 0.41 per 100 person years and the TDF FTC arm 1.22 per 100 person years with 13 and 39 infections respectively, uh, yielding a hazard ratio of 0 0.34 with a robust 95% confidence interval with an, uh, 90, uh, of 0 0.18 to 0 0.62, which is a clearly a superiority result. And also, um, as you can see, excluded our alternative hypothesis of 0 0.75, so a somewhat resounding superiority result. This is the Kaplan-Meier curve that accompanies that result. Um, again, a highly statistically significant hazard ratio of 0 0.34. So we also did some back calculations to evaluate our anticipated um, uh, HIV incidence assumptions in our population. Of course, we don't have a placebo arm, so it's actually unknowable um, what uh, the, the background HIV incidence was, but um, uh, we did have an adherence subset. I'll show you the data that populate this number in just a moment, but um, our plasma uh, uh, tenofovir was detectable in a, an adherence subset of TDF-FTC randomized participants of 86.5%. You'll remember at the beginning, I said that we had assumed that it would be 57%. And when we do a meta regression of all of the placebo controlled TDF FTC prep trials, you would anticipate that that 86.5% detectable rate for plasma tenofovir would confer about a 75% reduction um, in, uh, in risk in the individuals who were taking it with that level of fidelity. Of course, there are all sorts of biases that such an assumption uh, uh, introduces, and it's really dependent on the assumption that higher risk individuals were associated with higher adherence. But if you assume that that is that those caveats are true, and we observed a 1.22% HIV incidence, 
um, the, and that the risk conferred by the level of adherence seen in that arm of 86.5% based on TDF, TDF FTC use, that would back calculate to an HIV incidence estimate of 4.82% with a 95% confidence interval that's fairly broad, but shown here. If you apply that then to the incidence rate that was found in the cabotegravir arm, and again, this would be considered a counterfactual placebo and a fraught one at that, the, the uh, efficacy compared to this counterfactual placebo would be uh, uh, estimated to be around 91.5% with a 95% confidence interval of 82 to 96%. Of course, you can do more robust calculations using Bayesian analyses and the TDF um, dive tenofovir diphosphate levels in dried blood spots um, in methods developed by Dave Glidden. And we're looking at that as well, but we have not completed um, those calculations yet. And this should be seen as a very preliminary back of the envelope type approach to validate our initial assumptions. These are the data that support that 87% um, that detect detectable plasma tenofovir. Um, we did uh, look at plasma tenofovir and uh, dry blood spot tenofovir diphosphate levels um, in 372 participants. Um, you can see uh, the tenofovir calculations uh, of their assays on the right side of the slide. 87% had detectable at a 0.3 nanogram per milliliter level. 75% were greater than 40 nanograms per milliliter. And these are the overall levels um, here on the left side of the slide in the, in the dried blood spots, the tenofovir diphosphate levels um, that would be consistent and anticipated to provide high levels of rectal protection, 76.1% overall, um, slightly declining over time. Although the 80, week 81 numbers contain a small number of contributing samples and participants. So I would consider that an unstable result. So these are our conclusions. The HPT 083 original study design considerations were predicated on best available data. At the time of study inception, which was in the fourth quarter of 2016, there were unknowable parameters that included the adherence to daily oral TDF FTC. You can see that we underestimated that. We assumed 57% and found 86%. The background population level HIV incidence, we assumed about four to four and a half percent. We found, we think, 4.82% overall. Um, the CAB effectiveness relative to TDF FTC, we assumed 0.75 would be the hazard ratio. We uh, were wrong and we found a hazard ratio um, uh, that was much lower than that. And the adherence approach that we took in this study was one of best real world support. And I think that's really important because sites, particularly sites outside of the US really exhorted us to um, not pull out every adherence intervention that could be deployed to support TDF FTC adherence, but to um, uh, instead approach it in a way that clinics would actually deploy TDF FTC um, in real world settings. And so that was the approach that we took. On study, we had lower than expected pooled incidents when we were still blinded to the treatment arm distribution of those incident events, which caused tremendous anxiety on the study team. Um, and the take home message because of the result that we ended up achieving, I think is to adhere to scientifically rigorous principles and not try to move the non-inferiority margin mid study. You can imagine the scenario where the NI margin had been changed and then the observed results of a significant superiority result obtained, it would have been um, extremely embarrassing <clears throat> to say the least. Um, I would remind everyone as people consider study designs for new prevention interventions uh, going forward that high incidence populations do still exist. We, you need experienced, dedicated community-based teams and sites to engage most at-risk populations successfully. Commitment is required at all level of protocol conduct to engagement and retention. And despite the retention challenges we observed with the chaotic lives of the most at-risk participants, persevere because um, these populations do exist and with the right engagement strategies, um, results such as the one seen in 083 still are likely ach achievable. I will stop there and happy to answer any questions either by email or you can tweet me at the address here. Thank you very much.